What's up, everybody? Eric here. We are back with the Outlier Podcast, and I got my friend Jim Ropel here. He and I actually, we connected like almost a year ago, and then we kind of, you know, fell off for a little bit, but I'm absolutely stoked to have you on. I have done a lot of homework, and I follow a lot of what you talk about, and I am really excited to dive into your approach to the markets, because as we were talking about right before we started, a lot of what you do is different than what I do, and that's one of my favorite parts about the podcast. One is I get to learn about other approaches, but then two, we get to put different ideas in front of people and then let them see what works for them because there's a lot of ways to make money in the market. So welcome to the podcast. Thanks for taking some time to hang out. Thank you very much for having me here. It did take a long time to get this scheduled, but we're doing it. That's it. You know what? The thing is, it's like, I'm not always great at stuff, but I'm pretty damn persistent, man. So like, I'm always around. So whenever it lines up, it lines up. If it doesn't, it doesn't stay la vie. But I'm actually really, really stoked that um, we had a chance to line up because like I was telling you right before we started, I am a, a, not like a good friend, but I know Matt Caruso pretty well. He and I have talked quite a few times and I get a chance to talk about kind of like the, you know, small cap growth stock style style. That's a lot of, you know, can slim um, based, but I know that you obviously had a relationship with Bill O'Neill. Talk to me a little bit about your background. There's a lot of information out there. I'll put a link to your website in the notes below for people that want to like really dive in and learn all about you. But to get like a high level summary, just to introduce you to the audience, at least my audience, so that they kind of have an idea of where you're approaching this thing from, just a quick background on how you got started in markets and kind of generally what your approach looks like. Um, you know, my dad, my grandfather worked at Bally pinball machines in the stamping plant. This is 80 years ago or more. And Bally came public and he got stock as an employee. I mean, he was a factory worker. And so my dad started to watch Bally, my grandfather, my dad would always talk about it. And then um, I went to college and, my two best friends happened to be both very much into the market. One of their fathers was a stockbroker. I opened an account with him and just the people around me were in. Now my dad had no money. Okay. I don't want to confuse things. My grandfather had like, you know, 38 shares of Bally or something. There we go. And, um, but my buddies were very into it and we studied the markets. The crash of 87 happened. I, I took four and a half years because I was persistent to get there to graduate. And I, in 87, I graduated. The crash really shaped me and I, Went on an interview for a, a, a job as a stockbroker, which I didn't realize was called a cold call cowboy. It wasn't a stockbroker. There was no, you know, analysis going on. It was a sales job. I was hired and I was a loser in the markets for many years. And one day I went to the 7-Eleven where they had Space Invaders, Bally that was a Bally Midway machine. And I got an IBD, an Investor's Business Daily. And I read it. And then I read the Bill's book, How to Make Money in Stocks. And that was the game changer. My life immediately changed. Number one reason was I let my losses run when I was a kid. This is a long time ago, okay? This is 1987, 1988, 89. Um, I was fascinated by the markets and what they could do. And I love the interaction of weather, news, innovation, interest rates, politics. I mean, everything. It fascinated me. I loved it. And I immediately after I started cutting my losses, I started to implement better selection criteria and then technical analysis. And my results well, I immediately stopped losing money. Like, um, and then with time and learning how to implement, my results started to get better and very good and very, very good. And I eliminated the boom bust and I became more consistent. And then I started occasionally every few years to tangle up into a very big stock. And I made some pretty big money a couple of times. And that's the background, man. Yeah, it's awesome. It's so fascinating to me how many people I talk to on this that have so many similar aspects to their background and how this whole thing started. I think, you know, as you're talking about your just general interest in the connection between things, I 100% identify with that. It's like, looking at the markets is one of my favorite ways to learn about our world, because especially like all these different news sources are so political, like you never can figure out like what the fuck I'm reading. But then when I'm reading about anything from a financial perspective, like they don't give a shit. Like if it makes dollars, it makes sense. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But it's like typically a pretty decent way to consume information. And the other thing you said that I really identified with is the disposition effect, where traders tend to let losses run, cut winners too short. 
I think that's like one of the the first pivotal things that we all eventually change. So it's funny that you highlighted that one as well. Um, quick follow on question for you. When you first read Bill O'Neill's book, did you look at this optimistically and like, did it click and you were like, oh, I've been doing this wrong. I think this will work. Or was it more of a, I don't really know. Let me just try, see if it works. I'm curious how you approach the world of technical analysis specifically, because a lot of people, they'll say it's either voodoo or it's not, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, I, I need to tell you a little bit about my disposition. I am very questioning and counterintuitive. And if you tell me no, that means I'm going to do that. And my buddy <laughs> gave me a book called A Random Walk Down Wall Street. And I read it and I'm like, this is bullshit. I said, this is right for most people, but not except not people who are willing to do things that others aren't. And then I read about people who were the outliers. And I said, most people will never be an exceptional outlier because they won't apply themselves. So I read Bill's book and it there are many styles, many, there's probably 30 styles on how to invest. You have to find one that resonates with your nature. It's got to agree with your DNA. Mo there are a lot of styles that work, but they won't work for the wrong person or they won't work if it doesn't agree with you. And it agreed with me very well. And I, I coach so well. And I felt like through the book, Bill was talking to me. And then I started to go to see him to, when he would speak. Initially, he would speak for free. And then the price went to 300 bucks, then 500 and then 10,000. And uh, I, I went to see Bill probably two to three times a year, starting in around 1990-ish until a few years ago. And so, I oh, well, I also became an institutional customer of William O'Neill when I opened my first hedge fund, where I would talk to Bill all the time. I mean, so the I'm trying to answer your question. I might have gotten on a little bit of a tangent. No, it, it was perfect because essentially you were helping me understand how you approach the methodology and how it resonated with you. Because like I said before, when, you know, I, I actually just interviewed Tom Sosnoff not too long ago, uh, another time, who's a big options trader, not sure if you're familiar with him. He runs a pretty big network and, you know, he came from the pits and for him, he built Thinkorswim, which is a pretty popular platform. And like when they first built it, it didn't have charts because they never used them. They all thought charts was like fucking wizardry. So the a lot of people I find have like this polar relationship with technical analysis, but it sounds like it really resonated with you. Like when you looked at it, you're like, this makes sense. I can get behind this idea. I think if you look at the book, all, all the Market Wizards books, you look at all the greatest traders in the world. There's only one that I'm aware of, Michael Steinhardt, who was a fundamentalist. All, I don't like absolute terms. Everyone I'm aware of outside of Steinhardt was a trend follower. And charts are a visual way to follow a trend. I don't really think charts are predictive. I think charts give you a clue of the trend. And trends fail. Most trends fail. Most breakouts fail. Why is why risk management is so critical. That's kept me in the business for 30, I, I don't know, I started in 87. So whatever, how long that is, I don't know. Um, if you try to trend follow and you don't have risk management, you're going to get wiped out quickly. As a matter of fact, the market will seek its level. It will find your weakness. If you're greedy, if you're impulsive, if you're fearful, if you're, I mean, it, it, whatever your weakness is, um, the market is going to expose you quickly. And, and, and you're going to learn about yourself very quickly. You're gonna take a lot of losses and a lot of bruises. The number one key to spot a liar is I'm great. I'm the greatest. I'm killing the market. I've killed it every year for a thousand years. You're lying. You talk to the greats and they are, except for one or two that I know of. And the one guy who thinks he's great has not made any money. Um, the other one is kind of great and he has made a lot of money, but he's vocal about it. But people who are arrogant, the market will pound you down. It, it, it's going to beat you down. And you, you, the market teaches you to be cautious and careful and not arrogant. The market will expose your arrogance if you're, you know, I mean, so anyway, there's another giant tangent for you. <laughs> well, I, I love that tangent because I think, and that's one of the biggest things I always hypothesize trips a lot of technical traders up is when they apply their analysis, they start to say like, this should happen. 
and they kind of create their own reality on what they think should happen, completely foregoing the fact that the market doesn't give a flying fuck what they think should happen. It couldn't possibly care less. And to your point, that's where a lot of um, not speaking in absolutes. It's so funny when you said that, because I 100% resonate with that. I refuse to, because if I'm looking at a chart, I actually like to apply technical analysis, but I always view it as like probabilistic outcomes. Based on what I see, what is more probable here? Or what's the risk to reward here? Not a determinant, this should happen. It may or may not. I I don't know. The most technical patterns, whether it's a head and shoulders or a cup and handle or whatever you want to call it, the pattern will morph before it emerges out of the pattern you think it's going to uh, emerge out of. So that's why jumping the gun is such a flaw. And um, I, I, that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> yeah. So speaking of your kind of approach here, and obviously you're talking a little bit about the specific timing element. Everybody that I know that trades can slim, they tend to have their own twist on things. You know, they don't necessarily apply like purely what they see in the book. So based on your approach to can slim, what's, what does that look like? Is it a pure play based on what I've seen you talk about? It doesn't necessarily seem that way. So I'd love to dive into kind of your approach to canceling. So I think the Japanese had it right. Why invent anything? I am a knockoff artist of a, uh, someone who's well-known, who is not a snake oil salesman, salesman who probably made a billion dollars. And if he didn't pay so much in taxes like Buffett, he'd probably be worth billions. If I'm half as good, half as good, and I only make 500 million, I'm probably going to be just chill with that. I am a not, I don't deviate. Now, there are some things that I've learned that I do apply, but they're almost tertiary. There's right. things about the market that I've learned that Bill didn't cover in the book. Um, and I just, I just knocked him off. I mean, why deviate? If you want to build a birdhouse, why draw it up on a piece of paper yourself when you can buy a book and the guy's going to tell you exactly how to build the most beautiful birdhouse ever? Now, again, the saying, the difference between a hero and a crowd is one step forward. If you do what everyone else does, you're not going to be exceptional. But I'll respond to that with, I saw Bill live in a room with 400 people in it and I was, and he goes, how many people only buy new highs? I raised my hand and out of 400 people, there was like five. The rules, the book Reminiscences of a Stock Operator was wrote, written in the 1920s, 100 years ago, roughly. The, 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 the manual is there, but people can't follow it. They either don't have the emotional intelligence, don't have the perseverance, don't have, you know, there's a lot of reasons people fail, but the, the roadmap is there. So... I am saying I don't want to, you know, build the clock again without the manual, but I want to follow the manual. Most people don't, won't do that. And Bill doesn't talk enough about emotional control, um, which is really, like I said, the manual's there. The, it works, but few can implement it because they don't have the discipline. They don't have the patience. They're emotionally, you know, they're trying to survive, okay? Okay. Think about the, and I, I, I'm a huge Republican, okay? I, I was going to say it, but I sympathize greatly with a single mom with two children and a deadbeat ex-husband. How that was is my she, mom. Well, you know, what is her ability to get you clothed, fed, off to school, work her ass off all day, get you guys home from school, get you dinner, and then hit her second job? Where in there does she get to read Bill's book and then implement it and get 10 grand to start trading with? Like, you know, there's a you have to be in the right position. And I believe you make your own outcome. I, I totally believe in self-responsibility. You are you are where you are because of the decisions you made. Nobody else, everyone has curveballs. A meteor flies out, an asteroid flies into your life and smash your shit. It, that happens, it's how do you handle that? How do you overcome that? The losses I took when I was young were horrendous. It was emotionally beating, but I never gave up ever. You know, even I have bad years now. Um, you know, I've been in the business since 87 to today. I probably have a bad year. Oh, I wanted to say this. People who lie say I'm up 30% every single year. Well, that's not possible with the method we use. 
if you're you're going to have very big years and then small losses in years. Mm-hmm. That's why Bernie Madoff suckered everybody because he promised the Holy Grail, which was unattainable. It was one percent a year. I'm sorry, one percent a month every month with no down months. It's impossible. Sounds good though. Yeah, it's great. It's compound. You compound twelve percent out a year for fifty years. How much money? Tons, literally tons. I think, um, and that's actually funny that you bring that up because that's one of the things I've always revered about the way you guys trade is because you have this streakiness in your performance. Like when I talked to to Matt, I came across his U.S. Investing Championship performance, which is like three hundred plus percent in a year. So I, I trade derivatives. I trade both sides, primarily options, sometimes futures, depending on the product. But like my best year ever was just over 50%, which I'm super proud of that. But that's still like a sad, sad comparison to what you guys can produce. But- well, I don't know. I don't know. You know, what are your down years? Like if you can keep your down years into single digits and you have a, a 50% year every five years and you have a bunch of 20% years, your 50% is huge. 300% with a 200% drawdown or, you know, an 80% right. drawdown, that's nothing. 50% up years with 9% max drawdowns, you're going to make money. Definitely. Yeah. And it's, that's essentially what I've built my entire world around is the vast majority of the down years are small and they're super infrequent. Now I, I had down years when I first started, but to be also very clear, I've seen 50% once. So I have most of my time, it's somewhere in the twenties. So it's How still long? very, it's still really good for me. I'm 32. How long have you been in the market? Uh, since 2007, so 16 years. Your hundred percent years coming. It's in front of you. <laughs> it's in front of you. <laughs> well, I'll keep looking for it because it hasn't popped up yet, but I'm, I'm eager. It'll, if you want it, it'll come. Yeah, well, and that's that's actually one of the cool things as the account has grown is I'm really receptive to different approaches. So for a while, I traded a lot of volatility. Volatility trading can be very boring. It's a more of a numbers thing and it's in, in aggregate, but it's very consistent. But I started developing different strategies still via derivatives that let me take advantage of some of the things that you guys like to look at. So that's what I wanna spend a little more time on. So you talked about there are things that you've learned that Bill didn't cover in the book. One of them, you were talking about how you wanted him to talk more about emotional kind of side of things, but what are some of the specific market things that you've amassed over your career that you don't think Bill covered in the book? I am very much like Bill, a tremendous optimist, and but I'm not a perma bull. I will go to cash, but I understand there's bad periods. And Bill, t- Bill said, look, in a, in a downtrend, you have to go to cash. But he never really explained about the magnitude of how long bears can be and how brutal they can be. And if you're not careful how much you can lose, um, he said, look, just color your losses at 7% and walk away. And he didn't really go into the pain you're going to endure, even the greats, if you if you, if you you persist in this endeavor. Um, there's a, oh, God, you know, I could go through my thing and find some gym rules for you. I, I, have, I have 65 bill rules, Bill's golden okay. rule, then... Since Bill's no longer with us, I now have the gym rules, which are probably nowhere near as valuable as the Bill rules. But I'll maybe I'll look some up while you ask me another question. How about that? Yeah, yeah. I definitely want to hear more about the the gym rules. So yeah, when I think about a lot of what Bill taught me, it definitely was looking for strength. It's not really accepting anything less. And one of the things that he really encourage me to adopt is a different psychology when it came to specifically for bullish plays. But when I'm looking for bullish plays, I'm looking for reasons to say no. And as soon as I see one, then that's the reason it's time to move on to something else. Whereas I feel like a lot of retail traders, it's the inverse where they're trying to convince themselves to say yes. So when you're, you're, you're hitting a home run here. Okay. Yeah. There's 55 public, 5,500 public companies. I am distilling that down to like four i am so selective beyond incredible selectivity i am looking for excellence across the board in all all metrics um i won't put a trade on unless i feel i am being forced to buy or forced to sell i don't ever anticipate i over 
after cutting losses, which is the rookie mistake of rookie mistakes, not cutting losses, the second biggest rookie mistake is overtrading. And I overtraded like a champion. I was a rock star at it, buddy. Every trade used to get a confirmation in the mail. And it was like a blizzard flew into my house when the mail guy showed up. Anyway, I need the market to force me into it. And I, the, the more I trade, the more I lose, the more I get emotionally caught up in things. I'm no longer trying to pull the arm on the slot machine. I am not trading. The less I trade, the better I do. The more patient I be, patience, emotional control, discipline, long durations, outlooks, look 20 years down the road in, I'm going to be doing this for 20 years or more. These are all, the reason people fail is all those reasons right there, man. Um, so do we have some some gym rules? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Um, false narratives are so abundant, but the markets are lie detectors and ferret out the truth. Price does not lie or it can't lie for very long. Think about the invasion of Ukraine. Expectations were food and energy shortages. Like they were talking about in Germany, they were going to freeze to death in the winter. Yes. And there was going to be, you know, the price of wheat was going to go to $50 million a bushel. Price of wheat went down and no one froze in Germany. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, I, I can go on and on and on about just false narratives. You have to remove your personal bias and forget the news and follow the price. But you can get really scared by there's going to be starvation. Like literally, you're talking about wheat prices. Russia's, I'm sorry, Ukraine's the fourth largest wheat producer in the world. And, and you know, that's what a lot of people like subsist, they live on. Didn't happen. Um, let's see here. I can, uh, oh. You know, the greatest trader in my view is Stan Druckenmiller. Okay. He makes mistakes. He in 2020 got it wrong and he didn't make money. Um, oh God, I you know what? Look, I hear something. Bill didn't really talk about this as as much as I thought, but the average true market leader goes up about 90 94 to 98 weeks. It's a it's four to six beat and raise quarters. The te the def my definition of a true market leader is four to six beat and raise quarters. If you can get in a stock in the right size and sit, you, that, that's how you're going to make an absolute killing. And the, the stocks that I've made the most money in were all through beat and raise quarters. It was Bill stressed earnings and earnings growth, but he rarely talked about beat and raise. The the reason stocks move is because there's an earnings report. They beat. Now the analysts have got to raise guidance. You know, the estimates were a dollar. They blow it away. Then next year they had it for two dollars. Well, they got to raise it to three. Now that new information has got to be discounted into the price and up goes the price. That's how you get beat and raise. Or I'm sorry, that's how you get prices to move. The new information now has to be factored forward. Um, ugh, you know, Bill never talked about volatility contractions. Hmm. like the bitcoin market right now is dead the volume is dead no one cares ai has stolen bitcoin's thunder the story of bitcoin has only become richer and the contraction and volatility we're at some of the lowest levels of bitcoin volatility in history along with whale accumulation but anyway dude i don't i i'd have to really sort these out because there's so many of them and i I don't want to waste your time while I read looking for them. <laughs> hey, honestly, I, I like those ones that you shared anyways, but. Oh, Bill was, was a very heavy, Bill was a very heavy user of margin, which he talked about, but he didn't talk enough about it. He, he didn't talk enough about money management either. He would say, oh, you have an account with a uh, hundred grand should buy four stocks. Like he didn't, he said his money management was, you really shouldn't own more than seven or eight stocks. Like he didn't, go into that enough um man i got I, dude i'll I, how about i'll send you a couple of them you can post it up on your website or, or whatever yeah i love that yeah well and you actually just hit another thing i wanted to ask you about which is you know exactly the way that you think about managing your book because to your point 
if you want to catch these big runs, you can't be too spread out, right? If you have a little bit in a ton of different things, you get a giant move, it doesn't really fucking matter. But if you're too centralized, then obviously that presents its own issues. So how do you find that balance? This is an unbelievably good question. Because in markets like we're in right now, size kills. Size kills. Size kills in many ways. Most great money managers attract so much money that their performance is diluted. It's like putting cinder blocks on an Olympic athlete. He is an Olympic athlete, but you weigh a professional money manager down with too much. It, you know, I think can slim in a large scale is difficult to run over a hundred or two hundred million dollars. There's not enough liquidity in today's market mm -hmm. due to the amount of takeovers and mergers and buybacks. The supply of stock has shrunk, so liquidity is gone. And you took out the the specialists and the market makers. And now it's run by algos. There's not enough liquidity. Like you being in the futures market, you could scale futures accounts into the billions. You really could. So um, what was the question again? Well, quick caveat there, everybody. Eric is not scaling into the billions, just throwing it out oh, there. But Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> um, no, I was asking essentially oh, how you find the, the balance between having too big of a book where if you get your move, it doesn't really matter versus having too small of a book where you can get ran over if you're wrong. I just think Bill's stated method is very difficult for most people to implement because price will hurt you, but size will kill you. And mm -hmm. Bill stresses concentration, but I literally will trade 100 lots in testing a new bull trend and I'll trade 400,000 shares in bull markets in one stock, depending on the price. My, uh, you know, I'm looking to put five to 10 million in each position. So I'll just tell you a story. I had a, there was a computer system that was used on the Chicago Stock Exchange many, many, many years back. And this guy was the biggest trader on the floor in Chicago. He lived three doors down from me. I told him I had 27,000 shares of Siebel Systems in my personal account. And he looks at me, and that's just a long time ago. He goes, son, he goes, I don't know how much money you have. He goes, but that sounds like an awful lot of stock. And he goes, I'll just tell you, price will hurt you, but size will kill you. And he was right. And I got stopped out of my whole position and lost money on a stock that went up like 800%. And then I did it again in a stock called Therogenics. It took a lot of me touching that hot burner to learn this lesson. On the other side of things, I think if you get more than 12 stocks or something around that position, you become the index. So you, it's hard to beat the index when you almost are the index. If you want to have outsized gains, you need to really concentrate that down, distill into those big leaders. But now your volatility is going to go way up. Okay. So Bill didn't, Bill traded around his positions a little bit, but he didn't hedge. And I do. When a stock gets extended, the, Bill never really talked about this very often. You need to understand the personality of a stock. And if its personality is at 20 or 30% over the 50 day, it pulls back to the 50 day, you better start hedging. Because if you have quarter your whole account in a stock and it goes down 30% and it only goes to a normal place, which is perfectly healthy, can you take that drawdown? Now throw, mar throw margin on there. And let's assume that your other stocks are going to pull back at the exact same time because the general market's probably going to be in a digestion. Bill didn't explain volatility. And look, Bill made me. All right, my three hedge funds, my net worth is predicated on Bill. Bill speaking directly to me, paying attention to me, me knocking him off. I'm not knocking Bill. I'm just saying he should have told me the pain I was going to go through to get here. <laughs> yeah, um, definitely. Well, and still to your point, I, I find the same thing like, I am woefully unoriginal myself. And a lot of what I did was predicated actually on a like a, a mentor I found online. So it sounds like the start of a child predator scheme, but it's not. It was a great, he was an army dude that was just helping me out. Um, but he was an options trader. But it's the same exact thing where I feel like there's things that I've learned on my own that I've been able to apply and kind of adapt. And it sounds like that's what I took from what you were saying is that you still are an autonomous thinking human being digesting information and integrating that into your process. When you look at these stocks and they're starting to run up 20, 30% above the 50 day moving averages, 
how are you looking to hedge them? Are you taking size off? Are you using options? Are you putting on counter opposing trades? What's the hedge? I don't like to pay taxes. 50% Fair. of my money goes to the government. You, you mean, talk about yep. compounding with your, all your money or knock that down to long-term gains at 20%. So I don't want to dislodge my stock, especially my low cost stock. So I'm going to be selling in the money calls. Um, and I, and then is this, if, if I'm right in the stock, come, oh, by the way, I don't ever want to hedge my whole position because what if it right. blows off? All right. I'm going to hedge. I used to hedge like 20% and I realized that's nowhere near enough to dampen the effect of the pullback. So I'm generally going to hedge 30 to 50% of my long position within the money calls. That way the volatility and uh, the premium is going to time and volatility premium it works for me. It erodes. So I have that going for me. It's in the money. It's generally, I try to, you know, like 80 Delta, calls in the money shorting it's super deep yeah. yeah now the spread's big but how else are you going to keep your stock and hedge yourself down 10 15 percent or more 10 percent, 5 10 percent. so that simply i sell calls and i will trim off stock like this correction we're in right now was far greater than a garden variety pullback in a in a, in a bull market there's a lot going on we can discuss that at the end yeah, yeah. Well, it is, and that's another thing I, I did want to start getting your take on anyways. But before then, um, there was a couple questions I had from some of my community for you, one of which is um, when you're looking at the various can slim factors, how do you weight them? Are there some that you personally apply heavier weight than others, that kind of thing? Before I tell you this, you're talking about the fundamental metrics. I am a fundamentalist. I am a story. I understand Celsius, case growth, unit growth, total addressable market more than I do. But once I have the story down, I'll just state this. I probably made about 90% of my net worth in about eight stocks in 35, in 30, 35 years. I understood the fundamentals intimately in every one of them. Like I really, really, really deeply understood what was going on. But as soon as I get that clear, let's just take that off the table. Relative strength, group strength, general trend of the trend of the general market, but relative strength is going to take you right to the best names in the whole market. Anybody looking at stocks, it's like here, forget there's no money involved. You can pick for free a Vega, or a Yugo, or a Lambo, or a Ferrari. What, what are you going to take? I'm always going to go to the high relative strength Ferraris. I'm not. I don't want a Yugo. I don't want a Volkswagen. Um, relative strength is like a divining rod, right to the to the water with all the money in it. Um, group strength, up to down volume is wildly under misunderstood or underutilized. Uh, accumulation distribution, earnings growth, and earnings beat. That is. It's just like, why would a stock go up if it wasn't expecting earnings growth? And earnings beat, it's like, I call it the cockroach theory. If you're going to look in an apartment and a cockroach comes out from under the floor, rest assured, there's 10 more under the counter. Earnings beats are not one-off occurrences. They are usually serial earnings beats and re repeat. Now, you can not lean into that too much. They have to ma ma materialize. But when you have an earnings beat because of some new product, what do you think? People are just going to run to the shelves and clear them off for one quarter and then they're never going back again? No, people are going to tell other people that's going to be a, you know, an 18 month story at least. So there's relative strength up to down volume, group strength, um, tight. Okay. Now I'm going to go into technical. Talk to me. Tight weekly closes in the chart pattern is prevalent in nearly every, I didn't use every, I said nearly I don't want to paint myself into a corner like a Marine who's about to get killed. Um, they're just, if you look at historical charts of the biggest winners in history, they have tight areas from two to five weeks. And um, Baker Hughes right now just came out of and came back. It broke out of about a five weeks tight area. Now What's it's the not ticker for them. Say that again. BRK. What's the ticker for them? I'm sorry. B B K R on a weekly. Yeah, I'll grab it and then we can take a quick look together. If you want, I can share my screen. I got it. And you said you want to use a weekly chart. 
Yes, sir. Three years, five years. What tickles your fancy? Oh, that's perfect right there. Look, look at your red key. Um, go back five, six, eight weeks, and it starts the first red week. There's two red weeks. Keep, go to the right. Go right, 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 right. Up in the handle. Keep going. Five, a month oh, there. The handle. Right there. Yep. Boom. Look at those tight closes. One, two, three, four. Is it four or five? It would be better on a bar chart, and I don't want to waste time going to it. Five weeks in a row. You know how rare yeah. that is? Yeah, it's five. Yeah. And the group is number, the group strength is like, you know, out of 200, it's like three out of 200. It's, it's almost, it's elite, elite group oils on a run. Um, I, 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 my fund does have a position. I've been reducing it. Um, my lawyers love me that I just told you that. <laughs> um, Listen, you gotta give them work. You gotta give them a job. Look, they can make their money on billing somebody else for a freaking lawsuit. I don't need one. Um, anyway. Tight closes are a look. Can Slim is predicated on a detailed study of the biggest winning stocks in history and what characteristics did they possess, and it's all in Bill's book. Can Slim, it's all there. Now, the one thing is a gentleman I know named Mira Kroll found that something like thirty or forty percent of all big winning stocks have no earnings, which is contrary to Can Slim. The difference is that. When you have no earnings and you get into a bad market or a bear market, those stocks get pummeled more. Right. Earnings bring durability and earnings bring institutions. And when there are no institutions in your stock because there's no earnings and somebody goes in to dump 400,000 shares, who's there to buy it? If you know Fidelity says, I'm bid for 5 million shares, literally, they're there to absorb your shares. But when you're looking at some market cap stock at $3 billion and somebody wants to dump 300, 300,000 shares, there's no institutions in there. Earnings bring institutions. Earnings bring liquidity. So there's yeah. a bunch of Yeah. Well, and it makes a ton of sense too, because I think, I mean, you can look at, you know, aggregate numbers of performance, but then I think there's, you have to, you know, an interesting follow on study that comes to my mind for that is what's the probabilistic outcomes out of the total pool, right? Because my guess is probabilistically, there's likely a higher percentage that have earnings versus not, but you might there have are. a large raw number with earnings. That would be my guess. Look, it's much easier for me to sit when I know there's earnings. Right. Um, you know, biotech, I've been obliterated in biotech and I've made a fortune in biotech in a few mm -hmm. occurrences, but most biotech companies are research laboratories with no sales force. They're, they're, they don't even have a product. They're working on a product. And if you go through clinical trials and they don't pass the, the uh, FDA approval, it goes to zero, basically almost goes to zero. Now, once you have an FDA approval, and then sales occur, the Amgen's first reported earnings, second reported earnings, four quarters forward were 32 cents against a penny. <laughs> That's when they invented uh, Epigen, okay? That was the beginning of the move where it, the stock went to Mars. It, it basically changed the world of medicine. If you had AIDS or you were going through chemo, your red blood cells were being run down. You just, they injected you with this stuff and it ramped your red blood cells. So you could take more chemo, live longer with AIDS. It was a game changer. And then they came up with Neupogen, which is a white blood cell replenisher. It changed medicine. That was not going to be a one quarter earnings beat. And that stock went to Mars versus some company that has no earnings whatsoever. It's just like sales growth. I have a rule, gym rule, that I won't put more than one or two percent um, stocks in my whole portfolio into earning no earnings growth stocks. When the market is being led or augmented greatly by stocks that have no earnings growth, you're getting to a frothy market. When you get a lot of IPOs that have no earnings, you're late in the game. The IPOs that are coming out now have earnings. Okay. They are another rule. This is, you know, it's a rule. When the IPO window is closed, the first deals to come out are elite, elite, the best names. To 
in a bear market or after a bear market to get an institution to come up, pony up cash, they're only going to do that for the greatest stock in the world. They're not going to do it on a maybe. They're gun shy. They've been beaten up. So the best name, you, IPOs in bear markets are at the end of bears or new bulls. Those are good probabilities of being TMLs. Again, I don't like IPOs. 95 or 7% of all IPOs undercut their IPO opening trading day close within a year or two. The odds are terrible. Most of them are small, illiquid, speculative. I'm looking for more durable quality. You asked me variables. I'm backtracking. The comp rating. The comp rating is there for a reason. If you're buying a stock that is a comp rating below 90, there's something wrong with your stock. It's not elite. <laughs> mm. It's when you were talking about the, the biotechs, I really resonated with that because in trading volatility with options, that's spent a lot of time there. We call it, it's kind of like the sewers. It's where things are not liquid. There's a lot of volatility. And literally the way I've learned to hedge out risk in those kinds of trades is to just have a large number of occurrences, literally to have a large sample size. Because sometimes even when you're trying to find the fucking door, it's not there because there's no damn liquidity. So the, the biotech thought process you went down, again, also very much resonated with me. I've spent a lot of time, but you learn a lot of super cool things. That's the fun part there, I think. You know, being in the markets, my daughter, any daughter looks up to their dad and overstates the grandiose grandiosity of the of the father. But my daughter's like, Dad, you 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 just I ask you a question. She's like, you know the answer to all this stuff. I'm like, no, Sarah, my daughter Sarah. I go, I've been in the markets for third for a million years. I've been in a trucking stock, I've been in a biotech stock, I've been in a plastic stock. I know, I know this much about everything, but not enough to be valuable. So being in the markets is the most enlightening. I I I wonder. After understanding economics, like I'm incompetent to work at the Federal Reserve. I'm not an economist. I'm not that smart, but I understand economics enough to know a lot about the world and how the world works. And I look at people in Congress and I'm like, they are incompetent. They are incompetent to do their jobs. The president, maybe Ronald Reagan was not competent to be the drug czar, the housing czar, the leader of the military and all the other branches, but he brought in experts from that industry that were in that industry for many years and were top dogs in that industry. If you, if your presidential cabinet is not loaded with people from industry, you appoint them because of their clout or their donations. You're a charlatan. You're a schmuck. It, 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 you're, it's detrimental. That is, it, ah, tangent, man. You, well, it's it's fascinating because I find markets in general find people that can balance theory and practical application, which literally transitions over from exactly what you were just talking about, is this idea of needing people with some level of experience in both. When you look at your day-to-day -day, you know, habits, how much of it are you leaning on the theory of what you've learned versus the practical application of the skill set? Because I know for me, I spent a lot of time in theory up front, understanding again, how derivatives work, all the different details because they're very nuanced products. But then after a while, you kind of just have a feel for them. And I think the feel quote unquote is a lot of subconscious processing that just is happening in the background from that learned experience. But on a day to day, I have my things I look for, but a lot of times I can do a cursory overview and have a good quote unquote feel to whether or not this is the right place for me to be. Do you find the same when you're looking for your stocks or is each and every one a very rigorous process? I find that finding stocks is easy by screening. It's just second nature to me. The real battle is when the market's open and you're being fired at and your emotions are running high but I'm automatic. I have my stop losses. I know exactly where they are. I know from history when it breaks the 50 down volume, I, I'm watching the volume. I know exactly what to look for. But when the market's turning up, I have my ropeable report. I have my battle plan. You know, I'm 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 in the turret. I'm ready to go. I have the plan. It's right in front of me. So I don't have to, I will run screens in the day for price up on volume, but I already know what those names are because I did all my research on Sunday. Um, 
ugh, it's a combination. Like there's a, um, another uh, quote. It says, education is pretty thin stuff without experience. And I'll say something else. You can talk a lot and write a beautiful newsletter, but implementing whole nother world, 90% of the game is implementation. It's kind of like what did Tyson say? Everyone's got a plan until you get punched in the face. And the market is going to punch you in the face a lot. Um, so it's a combination of both. It's both. It's it's experience. It's really discipline to implement your plan. W whether it's can slim or value or GARP or, or whatever the heck you're doing. It's discipline to not be led by your emotions or scared by your emotions or become greedy because of your emotions. Like I said, the book, look, you have options for a strategic investment behind you, the green and white book. Okay, mm -hmm. I read the book a million years ago. Anyone can read that book and probably make money if they implement the process. Yeah, I think it's totally fair. I think one of the things that would help people now is there's unlimited information out there. And I think that people find themselves in just analysis paralysis, information overload. You can get to just this nitinoy level of detail with everything, but you found a pretty efficient way to just generally cull, you know, a large sample or a large population into a small sample, right? You have like your criteria that you're looking for. If somebody wants to get more efficient at scanning the market specifically for can slim style stocks, because that's your area of expertise, what are some of the introductory scans you think they could start looking at on a daily basis? You mentioned price by volume. I'm curious if there's a couple others, not necessarily for them to go start slinging trades, but to develop pattern recognition, to develop an understanding of what things pop up in this pool and what they generally look like. Minimum liquidity is an absolute must. And I use about a hundred million average daily dollar volume Below there is kind of the below $30 a share, below $100 million dollar volume is getting into the junk heap. Let's go below 50 million average daily dollar volume. RS, above 80, 85. I don't even look at things below 90. In my newsletter, I almost don't cover stocks with RS below 90. Comp rating, um, EPS in the 80s and 90s, at least, you know, I'm looking for 99. Um, it, it, dude, you could, anybody can learn to scan with MarketSmith mm -hmm. in about a month. When you generate those names, how do you handle them when you have a big position on and the market's pulling back because, uh, you know, uh, India threatened to nuke Pakistan overnight, or uh, there was a skirmish in the South China Sea and the Chinese shot down over fighters and the market gaps down thousand points on the open and you're long on margin. What do you do? Do you know what to do? Have you done it before? Do you have your do you have your stops all in place? Will you pull the trigger, or will you go? I know it's not going to be that big of a deal, and then it goes down another thousand points the next day. I mean, the scanning and finding those stocks is the easy part. That's you're not even you're walking out of the dugout in the first inning to hit to take your first swing. That's not even swinging at the ball. That's just figuring out what equipment you're going to use in the dugout. Where's your, what's your batting helmet? What bat are you going to use? Now you get up to the plate, the guy throw, will give you the chin music. You know, I mean, you're going to swing outside the box. Ex implementation is process and emotional control is everything. I, I'm, I am, you have to learn how to screen and know what criteria you're looking for, but anybody can tighten up those variables to where you're only generating 15 or 20 names. Now, once you have that, now what? You're going to buy it extended? You're going to buy it in the bottom of a base? Or are you only going to buy it on a breakout when volume comes in? Implementation. One of the things you mentioned, I forgot what podcast it was on, but it was actually really insightful for me when you were talking about kind of this idea of like a true market leader versus like the second and third place and how the difference in performance for the true market leader can be up 300%. And the second place guy can be like 150%. Like that's a massive difference between first and second place. How do you find first place? Screening for it is lar large, the, the metrics. Like if one has return on equity, that's twice as good as the other one. Little details matter. 
a horse that wins it at the racetrack wins by a nose, but pays 20 X what the second place horse pays. I did a study from roughly 1950, call it to 2010 ish of every group, the top five leaders in the group, the percentage gains and the difference between first and second. And the difference between the performance of one and two was 100%. How do you know? You screen for the metrics, but then the fundamental story, which one is taking over the market, okay? Monster, which very few people know, was one of the very best stocks ever in history. Celsius is now eating their market. Knowing the story at Celsius is really important. No, what's the total addressable market? What Which company has the variables that are slightly better than the other? The product, I mean, Bill would say to me, here's, I'll give you Bill gold. I'd ask Bill a lot should I sit through earnings? And he'd be like, have you been to the store? Have you used the product? Have you been to Starbucks? Do you have confidence in it personally? Do you count the cars in the parking lot? Using the product, having actual hands-on knowledge, what's your level of confidence? You know, you know what kind of, how much cushion do you have for the year? Is the market in a solid bull trend, a wishy-washy bull trend, or a bear market? What's the environment? You know, it's like, are we in an irrational exuberance market, Alan Greenspan? Or are we in a full-blown bear where they're pumping liquidity in because things are going cow shit? Th these are all reasons why you would hold through earnings. Um, it, you have to assume every earnings report, you could have a miss and it's going to gap down by over 20%. If you cannot tolerate that, you cannot be in the stock. Or you have to hedge. Now, hedging into earnings is different than her hedging into a pullback because I would probably rather buy puts or do a put spread because I don't want to give away the upside. If I'm in that stock through earnings, I think it's going to beat and I don't want to give up my upside. So I'm willing to pay the VIG, um, but I'll actually probably sell the, the put a good bit lower because I don't want to pay all the VIG. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. I want to buy the put. I want to buy the slightly below the money put. Closer to the money and sell the further. Yes. Because I just, dude, you know this, your futures, dude. What, four out of five options are, Eight and a half out of ten go worthless. It's actually much lower than that. That's like a really oh, my ankle. Common, yeah, it's a really really miscommon quoted statistic. But um, the vast majority are actually closed before expiration. So it's like sixty percent plus are exited before expiration. How about this? And then nine out of ten me, after held by retail go to zero. <laughs> well, that that I think is pretty. Pretty solid bet. <laughs> anything, uh, anything retails buy, and I think you can take a pretty good guess on that. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you, which you started talking about, but this is another question for my audience, which is one of the things I talk a lot about is if people are looking to trade directionally, whether it's bullish or bearish, to look for the corresponding sectors that are performing that way and then start narrowing down within those sectors, just trying to stack as many things in favor of your thesis. How do you go about identifying just market breadth and then what sectors you view are strong performing versus weak performers? All right, net new highs. Net new highs. The reason I never called this a bull market, I called it at best a transitional bull. When the market started to go up in January, February this year, the new highs never confirmed. Almost every, most days throughout the year, we had negative net we had negative, we had net negative new lows over highs. We never got into bull confirmed status. We had brief periods where they would new highs would ellipse new lows. But not only that, the new lows right now are getting into dangerous territory. It's we are not in every bull market has pullbacks and net new lows exceed new highs, but they're marginal. 40 mm -hmm. new lows a day, 100 new lows a day, 50 new lows. We're running big numbers here. We're not in a bull market pullback according to new highs, new lows, and the bull market never transitioned from a bear to a bull right there. Now, that's one thing you asked me to qualify. What was the other one on breath? You said breath and what was it? Yeah, other? breath was the first one. And then the other is just analyzing sectors to find what sectors you like to the upside, to the downside. I screen for everything. So I'm generally going to all of a sudden start to come up with um, diverging RS or RS, uh, leading RS. I screen for that all the time. Leading RS in a bear, in a pullback is gold. It's pointing you right to what the market loves. 
so leading IRS is a great screen, but when you start running screens like that or up to down volume over say 1.5, it's going to point you right to the leaders. And all of a sudden you're going to start to see a whole bunch of crop of these, whatever, whether they're, you know, shipping stocks or hotel stocks or semiconductors. And then I'll look at the group and then I'll distill down. I'll break down into what's the leader within the group. Now here's the issue. Anybody can find those through screening, but how do you know which ones are viable and are you usually when you find it, you're going to be late and it's going to be really extended. That's the third biggest mistake. Rookie mistake is buying extended. You're like, I found the number one group. I found the leader in the group. It's got everything. But now it's it broke out from it's 75. It's 95. Now it's 20 points over the breakout from the digestion. But if you're a rookie, you just buy it. And then it pulls back and you're like, it was the right name. It was the right sector. But you your timing was off. You don't understand um, congestion, digestions. Bases, chart patterns form. They're just digestions, whether it's a flat base, a cup and handle, a double bottom, what having shoulders, they're congestion areas with support and resistance. If you're buying extended from the last digestion, you're a rookie. That's probably the fifth one. <laughs> now, how do you balance, especially if these are longer term thesis, right? Like if we're looking at a, a three year weekly chart, that seems like a pretty long thesis if there's a breakout and I actually remember spending a lot of time um, in Bill O'Neill's book on this because I found it so interesting. It seems fascinating to me how imperative it is to get that initial timing right, even though this can be a really long thesis. It seems like if it's a really long thesis, you would give yourself more time, more variance, but obviously his argument is you, re you get to reduce a lot of risk if your timing is very good. So how do you find that balance between getting your timing as good as possible, but then also getting into something that you're expecting to run for the next year or whatever it is? Two things. Okay. The only time you're going to find a 99 comp stock with sky high RS in a base is in a bear market. Because the second that bear market ends, I call them basketballs underwater. It's just going to pop straight up and it's going to be extended into a day. So if you don't catch it on that day, you're now buying extended and your risk is up. Now, the second part of it is, it's not just enough to catch it at the right point. You have to catch it in size. The, probably the one of the most underrated things, and I, 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 I can't overstress this. You should make, I said, this is really important. Well, cushion, the value of cushion, until you have experience, you, you can't understand how valuable it is. If you don't have cushion and you are using risk management, you, you're living on a razor's edge. And if you're a moron and you have a TML right after a bear market and it's up 20% and you take that gain, now what? Now what's extended? How are you getting back in? Over the 98.4 weeks, most TMLs go up like 400 to 1,000% and you sold it up 20 at the end of a new, at the end of a bear. Fools move. So it's not just how do you catch it not extended, but you have to catch it in size because to have, if you have 10% of your account in a stack that goes up 100%, your equity moved by 10%. How often do you get a hundred percent gainer? Well, then you better have more than 10%. If now the problem is when you're transitioning from bear to bull and you're used to buying probing positions of hundred lots, but you really intend to buy 200,000 shares, but you're probing, probing, probing. So if you get traction, all of a sudden you get traction and you feel like you're beaten down because you're probably down for the year. You've lost money. You're in a bear, but you need to go put 20% of your whole account in a stock at the right time. That is only done with experience. No rookie, very few. I would, I will bet every time that you get a guy who reads Bill's book at the end of a bear market, they are not going to get the right stock in the right size. I'm not, I'm going to buy in the transition phase, I'm going to buy five or six stocks initially, probably buy three on the follow through day. I'm going to have to, it's a, it's, you're building positions. Your most stocks I buy, I lose, I'm wrong. Six or seven out of 10 don't work, even when I buy them on the breakout day. So that's three out of 10. It, it's just, it's a, it's a shifting matrix only to be understood through time understanding deeply where you are in the trend in the market. What is the general market? How is it acting? Is it appropriate now? It, th these th This can take decades to learn.
Okay, it's, there's no, I just explained it to you in a very cursory fashion, but to really learn it where you know, it's like catching surf. There's there's normal waves, then there's gigantic waves, and then there's waves that come around every five years. Well, you have to stick around for 20 years to be through the five big wave periods to understand, man, now it's time to throw the hammer down. Okay, we got to open fire right now. It's, it is go time. You're in the breach. There's no flinching now. And it's worth the risk. That's when I can take risk. I'm willing, because I know that the odds are high enough where if I'm wrong, it's worth taking that risk. But in a crappy market, in a perfect 99 comp stock that limps out of a base, I'll throw something at it to test it. It's more of a test. I'm not even trying to make money. I'm trying to determine if the market's ready for me to go all in. I'm waiting. It's like playing Texas Hold'em. I'm waiting for the right setup. What do I have? What's showing? It's early. And now I want to, now I want to, well, I want to slow play it to get them all in, but I want I need to ramp the, I need to ramp that pot up. I need to make it worth my while. I just said about 50 things. <laughs> One of the things you said there though, that I actually really love too, is just this idea of like remaining engaged, because I do believe at least for some traders, a lot of people sometimes go through periods where, especially the last few years, at least I know them, where they move to cash, they're not doing anything. And then they get really gun shy to do anything again, because they can't get the timing. They're not confident in what's going on. I actually really like this idea that you employ of kind of putting out these small feeler positions, one, to see, you know, what's working and to gauge the overall pulse of things. But two, I mean, it also gets you still moving. You're still doing things. And I don't know if you find benefit from that momentum in your experience, but definitely for me, I find that useful. I'll find things sometimes that I don't necessarily have the top most conviction in, but the probabilistic outcome still looks reasonable enough for me that I'm interested in it. I'm gonna just say, I, I, I'm gonna give you a little bit of my, my opinion. We're two and a half years into a bear market. If this market makes a new low, it's gonna be the fifth longest bear market in history and everyone is discouraged the fa the breakout the, the br last follow through day has failed the market's acting terrible people are fearful and they're looking away and they're going away they're running away exactly classic fool rookie move the major trends can occur change in three to four days it can change everything can change and now it's like well the war is escalating the government's probably going to get shut down. We have two idiots running for president. One's my idiot. There's a lot of reasons to be very nervous right now. And the market is down, trending down. In four days, this market could look, could look completely different. You're always three to four. I mean, the simple answer, you ask me a question with like 10 sentences, I'm going to answer, answer with one sentence. You're always three to four days away from a major market turn up or down. And right now, the feeling I get from talking to people, seeing the market, my PL is we're getting really close to a new bull market and mm. everyone's freaking out. So no, you can never look away. The rookies look away. The guys who will never compound their money for 50 years are looking away right now. The people who are still engaged in the process, and I don't mean checking in, I mean studying a lot. They will be there learned this from a guy at my club. I don't want to give you the full story because it's too inappropriate, but he just said, we're about to have a major market, a major move in, in treasuries. And he goes, it's not there now. He goes, but I guarantee you, I'll be there when it is. Now, whether it came or not, it's not the relevant point. The point is he's a professional and he'd been doing it for 30 years. He never looked away. I mean, Dude, that's 30 more minutes on stuff. You asked me one question. I ran away for five minutes with the answer. <laughs> Which is perfect. That's what you're here oh. for. We're here to listen to you talk, not me. I have a fucking YouTube channel and people see me talk all the time. So you're the star here. Um, but you started actually diving a, a bit more into your current market assessment, which I did want to spend a few minutes on. So you talked about kind of this underlying sentiment that you think we might be turning a corner, that there might be a bull market potentially in the cards. It takes only a few days to see a big change. Talk to me a little bit more about what you're seeing in the markets right now that give you that impression. Okay. Let me preface this whole thing with. 
Let's hear it. America is the singularly greatest country in the world, not by a little. It's the yeah, greatest brother. country ever in history. If you're in India or anywhere, Thailand, and you come up with the greatest idea in the world, the number one choice for you to go and start your company is America. And the number two choice is a wildly distant second choice. The world is run by dictators, despots, thugs, criminals are in government. That's how the government works around the world. Outside, in Europe, it's cronyism. In America, we have the freest markets in the world. So um, the, I call it the golden goose of capitalism. The golden goose of capitalism is never going to be, unless it's suffocated by socialism, the golden goose is going to produce the next Blackberry, the next Starbucks, the next... Uh, what Wells Fargo, United Airlines, Pan Am Airlines, IBM, Hewlett Packard, Digital Equipment, uh, all these companies. Because in America, it's one of the only places you can get rich and not in, get incarcerated or imprisoned or have it taken from you. To a certain Who's extent, you say calf? you're lucky if you're not. <laughs> right, got, right. The CEO of Luke Oils in Russia sitting in prison. It's worth thirty billion dollars. He's, he's in jail. <laughs> He's lucky they didn't just kill him. But the golden goose of capitalism is never going to stop birthing these opportunities. So you said it looks like we're going to have a bull market. Well, I said you said it that. Like, it looks like we're going to have one now. We're always going to have a bull market unless we get suffocated by socialism. So there's always more. Listen, the guys out here in the labs, in the science park, not too far from here, they don't care about a recession. Or a bad market, they're they're mixing shit and test tubes and splicing atoms and you know writing code. So the market, we just have to get the 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 general market to get in gear here. Now let's take a look at history. I, I think the market topped not when the index topped. It topped when the advanced decline line topped in February of twenty one, which means we've been in a bear for two and a half years. That is really long by historical standards. Now you can fight with me on when. But no matter how you look at it, you want to go from the top of the um, mark, the top the market made it, the top the Russell made. It's still long by historical standards, and I think it's longer than that. In order to assess where we're going to be, you can't look behind you. You can't look at what's happening today. You have to look what's going to be in eighteen months. This is Stan Druckenmiller. In eighteen months, the Fed will have crushed inflation. The Fed is not going to screw this up. They may kill the economy but they are not going to let inflation get out of hate. They could, they could break the economy, which would, then we're going to have a recession. But you know how many bear, mark, or bull, bear markets end in recessions? People are like, it's a recession. The market starts going up like, I can't buy. So anyway, the Fed, at the very least, will not be raising rates in 18 months. They may raise rates two, three more times. They might, raise one, they might not raise at all. But 18 months from now, they are not going to be raising. So monetary policy will be a, it may not be a tailwind if they're not cutting, but it's not going to be a headwind. Again, this goes back to the golden goose of capitalism. I read a report from a very reputable source that said AI, just fasten your seatbelt for this number, is going to increase global GDP by $15.9 trillion by 2030. $15.9 trillion. That doesn't include EVs. That doesn't include biotechnology. That doesn't include, I mean, there's doesn't include blockchain, crypto, the digital revolution. The innovation that we're sitting in front of right now is possibly the biggest I've ever seen. The advent of AI is going to be bigger than the internet. Okay, that, that's the promise. And I have every reason to believe that it is not 3D printing. Okay, it's not, um, th this is real. If AI improves margins at most companies, but by three basis points, I'm sorry, by 3%, what's that going to do to PEs and earnings growth? What if it improves it by 8%? Where will we be when the Fed stops raising rates, a tidal wave of innovation, and now AI ramps everyone's margins up? Where's the market going to be then? But all they're looking at today is we might have one more rate hike and the, the, the government's going to shut down in a week. And we got two morons running for president. They're so short term. You can't, if you're looking out a month, you're missing, you're, you're damn near driving your car through the rearview mirror. You got to look through the windshield 18 months forward. The world's going to be radically different. We might, there could be some type of stalemate in the war in 18 months. 
Russia won't have any people. There won't be any people left to fight the war. They'll all be dead. Um, the sentiment is incredibly ugly. And I'm just telling you, those are my reasons. And by the way, if you look at the indexes, they remain in a massive cup and handle. You want to look at the NASDAQ, the only Russell, not the Russell. The, and there's another breath measure. Until the Russell exceeds 2000, we're not in a bull market, in my opinion. We need to have net new highs over lows in excess of 150 a day every, you know, most days, and maybe as high as four or 500 a day net new highs. So we're not there today, but don't take your eye off the ball. Okay. If you decide to, you know, this is time to double, redouble your efforts. This is no time to be looking away. This is, uh, if you're ever going to focus, you focus at the end of a bear. And I think we're very, very close. If, if we have to go another year, I will be the most bullish person in the world. That'll be three and a half years of a bear market. Okay. You won't be able to nail, you'll have to nail me down. All right. I rest. I actually think there's a lot of merit to your case. I believe a lot of the way that you're positioning Dude, it. I said it. <laughs> yeah. I'm joking well, massively. Oh, I know. <laughs> I could um, be so wrong, dude. We could listen. The markets could make a new low before this happens. I'm not saying I today. Think, well, the part that I want to explore that you were talking about that I'm I am curious how you value this, and I'm going to put socks on now because my feet are cold. Um, but do you think that the prospects of a recession could drastically extend the time frame that we're in a bear market? Because that's the thing that. I agree with you in that I believe that the Fed is very likely to not permit persistent expanding inflation. Like they've made that clear. And I actually, that's like, other than them starting super late in my completely uneducated, unqualified opinion, I think they started trying to tackle this thing a little bit late. I do think that Big Daddy J Powell has been pretty fucking clear about his mission here. And he's been beating that same goddamn drum the whole time. So I give him a lot of credit for that. But I am curious for the propensity here for us to have this over tightening cycle that then puts a pretty big wrench in our ability to smoothly exit this as compared to coming down in a fiery ball. I really don't know either way, but I'm curious how you kind of think about the unwind. So you're, you're onto the, the lever that could extend this. The odds are the Fed will over tighten. That's historically their the way they they over they over loosen they over tighten. We've had an inverted yield curve for over a, a year, at least a year. The odds of a recession are, but the counter to that. Well, first of all, if we have it, depending on how deep it is, people are going to have to slash uh, S and P earnings, and that's going to elongate. I'm trying to say yes. My answer to your question is yes. A, a, a recession is going to delay this for a bit depending on how deep that recession gets is going to predicate how deep, how much it pushes it forward. But if we do that, think about the duration of this bear market. You pull a rubber band out like this, it just goes back like that. But when you pull it out like this, it goes, bam. The worst, if we have a bear market, a deeper bear because of a recession, we're going to stretch that rubber band so hard. When it, when it, when it comes back, we're going to have a monster opportunity. This will be a generational wealth opportunity. But the other side of it is, and this is why the Fed is going to really, well, oil could kill the market for the Fed. Oil right now, the oil is the largest component of the CRB, which is running rates, which is running the dollar. Okay. Oil, rates, dollar, kryptonite in an uptrend. If we, the labor market is so strong, the labor market it's it's unbelievable how strong it is. So there's yeah. this juxtaposed issues the Fed's trying to deal with. I would not want to be the Fed. They pay, painted themselves into a corner, but they're going to win, and they should remain independent. And uh, you know, politicians are going to want to jawbone the Fed to loosen. And Powell's got to hold his ground. The the nightmare scenario is that they start to loosen when inflation's not dead. Now I just don't think they're going to do that. I. I as much as I give them no credit, because <laughs> they're generally trying to preserve their power as opposed to do the right thing, I don't think they're going to screw this one up. And if they do, I have to change my case. And I am always in flux. 
I laid out my bull case. I've been doing this for, I, I figured it out because my math is so bad. I've been doing this for 38 years. My experience tells me we are at the precipice. We're very, we're within on a long, if we have to wait a year for a bull, I'll be shocked, but I will flex if the war breaks out into other continents, if the Fed preemptively lowers rates and inflation ignites, but I don't see that. That's not my base case. So again, I'm really, really, really bullish. My, my market temperature for a year out is a 10, max bullish. Short term, I'm a two. And after today, it's probably like a one and a half. But I'm looking way down the road. And here's the thing. If I said to you, Eric, you have to wait nine to 12 months to double your money. Are you okay with that? Would you Done. do that? Done. That's what we're looking at. This isn't going to be, a, this is not going to be, if the bull market breaks out in a month, it's not going to be a garden variety bull. If we wait a year, I mean, dude, the opportunity. So it almost seems like we want this to go on longer because of that potential momentum up and out. Well, you do. I if, you, if you Yeah, if you told me I have the choice between nine to 12 months to double, or if I have to wait 24 months to triple, I mean, I'll take the triple, triple and a half. But you're logical and willing to wait and you're patient. Most people want, right? Like, you know, the game where they say, we're going to put a dollar bill in the middle of five people every 30 seconds. And the longer you wait, the more we'll put in. And how long will they wait until they grab the money? They always screw that up. Okay, people want it now. And that's another thing. People want to get rich quick. They want to do it now. They want someone to give them the stock idea, not the re reasoning to find it. People are just, humans Lazy. are not very, uh, you said about information and information overload. It's not lack of information that people don't succeed. It's lack of desire to read the information. And then it's lack of discipline to, to implement it. And it's lack of perseverance to implement it for decades. You wonder why people don't get rich? So yeah, your case is right. I believe your case strongly. I'm going to run out of power here. Um, anyway, that's it, man. I believe strongly. We are, my 30X years of experience tell me, dude, people, not just anybody, brilliant people, CEOs of major companies are saying, AI is the greatest opportunity in our lifetime. It is akin to the invention of electricity. All right, this is a... How do you balance hype though? Because to be clear, I'm actually of the same exact opinion of you. I really do think AI is revolutionary, but I also saw all of these different metrics talking about how the metaverse was gonna be an $800 billion business within by, I, I literally think it was like 2025 or 2030 or something like that. It was like very quick. And that one, I honestly didn't really believe in, but still, I, I'm not the authority. It could or could not happen. But my point is, you know, people can get a little emphatic about things. How do you structure that? How do you value that? I haven't bet it yet. Market's in a downtrend. When the trend turns up, I'm a trend follower and I'm going to follow it as long as it goes. Okay. I watched the build out of the internet from ground zero IPO department at Morgan Stanley. Okay, I took a lot, I was involved in allocation of these deals. I mean, I did Palm, I did Redback, Brocade, but tons of names, big names. And I watched the internet get built out and I watched the companies come public and I watched what they did and I watched how most of them didn't have, I, I've seen this before. This is not 3D printing, okay? And the one rule I read to you was think for yourself on face value, did the metaverse seem to me you like, I'm going to put, you know what the most unsexy thing? You want to repel the opposite sex? Put headgear on your head, okay? It's just, it's just, it's like there, there's there's lag in them. It, it, they're just a pain in the ass. The metaverse is going to have some uses, but on face value, when I looked at it, I just didn't really, I, I, I kind of wanted to get lured into it, but it's been the grandest failure. AI is already changing SaaS companies, ServiceNow, Adobe, uh, HubSpot, um, Palo Alto for security. The AI in the 
drug discovery for biotech. Now, this is, I believe this. Now, I haven't bet it because there's being right and then there's being right at the right time. And this is not the time today. But we could have a follow through day late next week or early next week. And if we do, I'm going to probe it. And if I get traction, I'm going to build. But if we make a new low into the fall, into Thanksgiving, and, and you know, the IWC, the small, look, IWC almost made a new low for this whole cycle. The Russell is, is a, a base hit away from making a new low for the cycle, which will definitively make this the fifth largest bear market, longest bear market in history. Okay. So I believe it. And I'm a huge optimist, but until the trend concurs with my thinking or confirms it, I don't bet it. It's an, I have an opinion and I don't bet opinions until the trend confirms my opinion. I will bet the trend against my opinion. If the trend moves in a direction, I don't believe in. I will, the, I make mistakes and lots and lots of them. And when the trend turned up in the big seven in January, February of this year, I didn't bet it because I just thought mm. the market was too thin. Look, I, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, after as many years as I've been doing this, I make mistakes. Okay. The, but again, what separates the greats from the also rands and the losers is how fast do you recognize you made a mistake and reverse your position and smash your ego. If you have a giant ego, oh no. I'm right. Market's wrong. And then I'll go bye bye. You're out of the bit. You're, go, you're, go, you're out. In what three, I like to tell, three. what I like to tell people is, uh, do you want to be right? Or do you want to make money? And you got to pick one. And it's hard. Um, yep. I chose golf, my marriage, my wife and the stock market. Well, maybe we could, how about pickleball, jujitsu, Muay Thai? How can we work on this golf thing a little bit? Maybe we could slide a little, extracurricular activity in there i mean dude all these things take incredible amounts of discipline and being wrong if you endeavor into almost anything and you're going to be great you're going to be wrong a lot to get to the top if you if you're not going to be wrong you're not going to get there you're not trying <laughs> well i feel like it, it also just proves that somebody's staying in their comfort zone in a certain circle of competence and you're not stepping outside of it because, you know, to your point. And I feel like when I look at a lot of traders, they also miss a lot of interesting opportunities. That's why I like options and derivatives so much is because early on, I never fell in love with trading up, down, sideways. I really don't give a fuck which way the market can go in fucking circles. The fact of the matter is, as long as I can find the correct strategies that fit the current market environment, that's literally all I care about. So I, I feel like your point on the death of ego and just setting your personal pride aside and just doing your absolute best to interface with the markets really resonates. I, in a lot of ways, people think I'm unusual and, and you know, There's a, I saw a thing today that said, just be happy with what you have. And then there's like the guy who's not happy with what he has and he wants yeah, to climb. Like that. They say, live a balanced life. Well, you can't be number one if you're living a balanced life because there's a lot of other people who are totally cool with being 100% all in on one thing. I spend my time in the markets, golfing, eating and drinking with my family and friends. That's pretty much it. I don't do much. I travel a lot to play golf. I'm totally unbalanced. I am. I'm very happy with what I have and I don't do it. I love, I love the money. Let's not lie to ourselves, but I do it to be right. I do it to notice that politics are moving like this. Interest rates are moving like this. Innovation is moving like this. These patterns are setting up. This is the leading group. This is the leading stock. And all these variables culminate into something that I believe in. And then I bet it. And then it works. The fulfillment, the level of satisfaction of being right trumps the money. I mean, again, I'm not, I'm, I'm 58, man. I've been doing this for a long time. I have, an, I have enough money. I get revved up by the success, by being right, by 
playing Stratego and figuring out all the moving parts and, and betting it. And when it works, it's great. Mm -hmm. I, it's the, one of the most greatest feelings ever. So with that said, I like the game I've learned. I've expended an enormous amount of time and energy and emotional beatings to learn it. I think to learn a whole nother like shorting. I mean, I do short occasionally, but I'm usually wrong. By the time this optimist goes short, that's a signal for all of you guys <laughs> listening. But I, I don't, I am somewhat happy with the game I've learned. And I think the right. effort necessary for me to learn another game, like polo, not playing, okay, out on that. Another method of investing, I, I like the model I use because I know it really works. And I'm good with, I guess I'm good. Specialized. I have very much so specialized. And yeah. I think when people bastardize a method, they, 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 they can make it perfect and better, but usually they follow it up. Look, if Bill was a billionaire, if I only make half a bit, uh, you know, 500 million, I'll be just okay. And I'm not even remotely close. I'm, well, I'm, I'm doing better than I was a long time ago. You compound your money for 35 years. We'll see how much money you, you're only, you're 16 years in, man. I'll be, well, I'll be old enough to watch you another, another 16 years. We'll see how much you compounded out. It, you'll, yeah. you'll probably say enough. Well, yeah, well, we'll, we'll see so far. So good. No complaints. So yeah, I, and it's funny too, because I, I'm very similar to you in that a lot of what I'm doing is process driven. I'm at the point now where I've actually moved a lot of my investable capital into other stuff. Like I, I invest in commercial real estate now, regular real estate, and it's, they're just interesting to me. And there's some really cool opportunities. It's a fun way to learn different things, but to your point, I feel like really embracing the process has served me very well. And I, I honestly think that's probably one of the only ways people are going to make it in anything that they're trying. Cause again, like if, when I, when I play golf, right, I am, I, I literally couldn't even feel comfortable labeling, like labeling myself as awful. Like I shouldn't step foot on the fucking green. Like I don't belong there. And it doesn't even begin to scratch the surface. So it's like, for you to get good at golf, it means you went through that same phase I did where you first stepped on it and you sucked. And then you probably just decided, um, ah, let me see if I can do it again. And then you slowly have gotten better. And I'm sure, you know, over your time frame playing golf that you've really invested into that process. So it's, it's really interesting to me to see somebody again, like you with another parallel, which is this process driven approach as compared to outcome driven approach. I think that that's pretty common across the threads I've seen. I never ever thought what has happened to me would have happened to me because I went to see Bill two or three times a year. I never thought I'd have a hedge fund. I just wanted to learn how to make money and use the markets. I love the markets. I didn't, I didn't know anybody would ever want to have me in a podcast. Like that was the farthest thing in my mind when I'm on a jet to California to go see Bill. But all that 30, you know, 30 years of going to see Bill. It, this is what it's turned into. I had no clue. When I started to play golf, I was afraid of tee boxes. They had little ponds in front of them because I couldn't get the ball over the pond, the little pond in front of me. I don't know if you know about handicaps, but everyone had, if you, my handicap when I started was at 36. I got 36 strokes. And, and the reason I was a 36 is because they didn't have a 46. I couldn't even play to a 36 handicap. But going to a golf pro once a month, every summer for 20 plus years has brought my handicap down into the mid single digits. I mean, it was 20 years of dedicated, and I'm not a great golf. I mean, I'm a good, I'm a good golfer. I'm better than most people, but I'm no scratch golfer, but it didn't, it took two decades or more. Investing's taken 30 plus years. Um, and I, and I still miss hit t shots all the time and i and i lose money routinely in the stock market but i have a friend i hang out with a lot of guys and you know guys bust each other's balls and hackle each other and my buddy goes roll he goes you're a one trick pony and he goes but it's a really good trick it's one trick i'm really i'm i'm i, I hesitate to even say i'm good i've had some successes but the trick I've learned is is a is a value is a value. If if you're the greatest mail sorter in the world, you better invent a machine that sorts it for you because you're not going to make any money. I mean, the world doesn't value packing bushels of corn. 
the the thing that I engaged in, the endeavor I chose, when you get it right, people are really willing to pay a lot to have you run their money. Okay, when you're the the greatest quarterback, how many guys can throw for 500 yards in a football game or whatever? What's that worth? You bring in a winning team, you bring in a couple billion dollars worth of ad revenue. Are they willing to pay 30 million a year? Hell yeah. The guy selling the beer in the stands, no one gives a shit about the ability to take five bucks and hand somebody a beer. Anybody can do that. That's not a valuable skill. But it doesn't mean he's not valuable. As a human right. being, he might be the greatest person in the world. The skills yes. he's chosen to master, cracking beers and handing them down to roll guys is, is no one gives a shit. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's really interesting to see and just learn more about your process. I I mean, I've really, really enjoyed talking with you, to be honest. It's I figured that I was going to like you just based on the way that you have good energy in general. And I find myself similar. Like, I'm just stoked to fucking be here. So every time I come across other people that have a similar disposition, it stokes me up even more. But um, before we log off, I know that you have a couple different places, you know, people can check you out, learn about some of the things that you offer. Could you share a little bit about those? And then I'll also throw links in the show notes below. Dude, I really appreciate it. I, I enjoy doing this. Like I, I finished things like this and I, I looked at the clock. We've been doing this for a long time. I'm super yeah. happy. To be, I'm, I will turn off. This the, is my uh, longest one to be clear. Dude, when I, when we log off, I'm going to go, wow, man, I feel great. I I'm energized by this, but thank you for asking about well here this is the first role play report i writ i wrote in uh 1992 these are versions some of them even dated they're issue one through whatever and in here i cover well i disbanded it but i restarted it about two months ago every sunday night i write a 50 to 70 page report covering every leading stock every index every variable that's important to the market whether it's interest rates the dollar oil I give you my comments. I give you my best ideas. And then on Wednesdays, I do a video where you can um, email in your questions. And I, I will answer questions for two hours. In the first part of it, I'll give market commentary. So that's a two-part package. Um, you can get it at theropelreport.com. If you buy the bundle of the Sunday night research report and the Wednesday uh, webinar, where I answer all your questions on CanSlim or anything about the markets, it's like 40% off if you buy the bundle. Um, and I think it's an amazing product if you want to learn Can Slim. You know, if I would have had, I never really got to talk to Bill one on one for maybe 10 years after I'd followed him. But when I became an institutional customer of O'Neill and Company, he would call me and I would call him and we we talked not weekly, but more more than monthly. Had I had that access when I got started. I might be worth a half a billion dollars right now. I am here to teach you everything that I know without you having to lose a ton of money to do it. Let me, I've already taken the bruises. I will answer all your questions. I'll give you all my best ideas and I'm going to give you like 40 off if you buy the bundle. And thank you for asking. I really appreciate it. Subscribers, I have subscribers all around the world. It's, it's awesome. It's two weeks free. That's awesome. Yeah, I think it's awesome. So, and to be honest, I'll probably take a look at it myself and then I'll let people know how it goes. So I think that um, the stuff you talk about, the way that you approach the markets, it's it's awesome. And I think that you have a really, really fascinating skill set. You talk about it in a really invigorating way. So genuinely, thank you so much for so much of your time today and hanging out for a while. I had a blast chatting with you. Um, and I'll definitely follow up with you again to see if I can learn some more golf parlance and then to, I mean, really, I just fucking hate that sport. It's so goddamn boring and slow. But nonetheless, I still respect the skill that goes with it. I'm still hopeful I can get you on like the jujitsu mats or something for a little bit. It's a little more fun, I think, but we'll see. Before we go, I want to say two things. Number one, when I see a military truck going down the highway, I tell my kids, salute them. We owe them everything. I have such reverence for the military, for the power we project around the world, for protecting everyone around the world for the freedoms we have, it is all freedom, our free economics, global trade is predicated on free, free shipping channels. That is all because of the Navy, the Marines, Toby Keith, call a Marine. I love the military. And I'm not just saying this because you're a military guy. I believe this since I was young because of my dad. And I also want to say, do not ever get 
too bearish. Always lean a little bit bullish prudently because the golden goose of capitalism is never going to stop birthing these new innovative companies that are going to gentrify the poor in the world and make everyone's life better and create trillions of dollars. It's never going to stop. So right when you think the world's coming to an end, there's going to be a stock called Ascend Communications, and it's going to run up 30% in three days, and then it's going to go up 2,000%. And there, we're just around the corner from that right now. So anyway, thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. We'll do it again maybe in six months. Sounds like a blast, man. Thank you so much. All right, buddy. Have a great afternoon.